The Call of the World by Jack London Chapter 1 Into the Primitive Oh, longings no minute leap, chafing a custom's chain, along with its bromel sleep, wakens a failing strain. But I did not read the newspapers, or he would have known the trouble that trouble was brewing, not alone for himself, but for every tide water dog, strong of muscle and with warm long hair, from pungent sound to San Diego. Because man, groping in the Arctic darkness, had found a yellow metal, and became, because steamship and transportation companies were booming the find, thousands of men were rushing into Northland. These men wanted dogs, and the dogs they wanted were heavy dogs, with strong muscles, to which, by which to toil and furry coats to protect them from the frost. But lived at a big house in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley, Judge Miller's place, it, it was called. It stood back from the road, half-ridden, hidden among the trees, through which gl- glimpses could be caught the wide cool veranda and run around its four sides. Houses were approached by graveled driveways which round about through wide spreading lawns and under the interlacing burrows tall poplars. At the rear things were on even at the rear things were on even a more spacious scale than at the front the giant stables of the brothers and grooms and boys held full rows of vine clad servants' cottages an endless and orderly array of outhouses, long grape abhors, green pastures, orchards, and berry patches. Then there was the pumping plant for the Eternsian well, the big cement tank where Judge Miller's boys took their morning plunge and kept cool in the, art, in the, in the hot afternoon. Over oh, this great demise, Buck ruled. Here he was born and here he lived for all years of his life. It was true, there were other dogs. There were not, could not be other dogs so vast a place, but they did not count. They came and went, resided at populous kennels, or lived discreetly in the recesses of the house, after the fashions of toots, of Japanese pug, of Jezebel, the Mexican hairless, strange creatures that rarely put nose out of the doors or set foot to ground. On their hand there was... Were well, the fox had terriers, a score of them, at least two yoked, fierce, fearful promises at Toots and Jezebel, looking out the window at them, protected by a legion of the housemaids, armed, brooms and mops, but Buck was neither house dog nor kennel dog. Whole realm of his, he plunged into swimming tank or went hunting with the judge's son he escorted Molly and Arch Alice, judge's daughters on long twilight or early morning rambles on wintry nights he lay on the judge's feet for the roaring Larry fire, he carried the judge's grandsons on his back or rolled them in the grass and guarded their footsteps through wild adventures down to the fountain the stable yard and beyond <coughs> and even beyond the paddocks were, and the berry patches. Among the terriers he stalked imperiously, and Toots and Isabel he utterly ignored, for he was king, king of all the all creeping, crawling, flying things of Judge Miller's place, humans included. His father, Elmo, a huge Trent Bernard, had been the judge's inseparable companion, but bid fair to follow in the way of his father. He was not as large. He weighed only 140 pounds for his mother. Shep, been a Scotch shepherd dog. Nevertheless, 140 pounds, to which was added a dignity that comes to good living and universal respect, enabled him to carry himself in right royal fashion. During the four years since his puppyhood, he had lived in a state of so stated aristocrat. He had fine pride himself, even was even a trifle egotistical as a country gentleman sometimes became become because of their insular in situation. But he had saved himself by not becoming a mere pampered house dog, hunting and kindred outdoors delights, and kept down the, the fat and hardened his muscles, and to him, as a cold 
turbing races as other water had been a tonic and health preserver. This was the manner of the dog Buck was in the fall of 1897 when a Kondike strike dragged men from all the world frozen north but Buck did not read in his paper and nor did he know that Manuel of the God's helpers was an desirable and a desirable acquaintance Manuel been setting sin he loved to play Chinese lottery also in his gambling he had one besetting weakness faith in a system this made his determination certain for a play but a play in a system requires money or the wages of God and his helper do not lap over the knees of a wife a numerous pro- pro- programming agency a judge was sat was at a meeting in the Raisin Growers Association. The boys were busy organising an athletic club. And a memorable night of Manuel's treachery. Treachery. No one saw him. And Duck got off through the orchard, on which Buck imagined was merely a stroll. With the exception of a soldier man, no one saw them arrive on the little fag station known as College Park. This man talked with Manuel, and the money chinked between them. You might wrap up the goods before you deliver them, the stranger said gruffly, and the Manuel doubled a piece of stout rope around the buck's neck near the collar. Twist it if it, if it, it ate you choke and plenty, said Manuel, and the stranger grunted a ready affirmative. Buck accepted the rope with great dignity, to be sure, his own wanted performance, but he had learned to trust in men. He knew to give them credit for wisdom that outreached his own, but when the ends of the rope were placed in the stranger's hands, he growled menacingly. He had merely invitated, invitated his displeasure, his pride believing that to imitate was to command. He, to his surprise, the rope tightened round his neck, shutting off his breath. In quick rage, he sprang at the man who met him halfway, grappled him close by the throat, with a death twist threw him back over to his back. Then the rope tightened immensely. A buck struggled in a fury, fury, fury. His tongue rolling out of his mouth and his great chest panting through furtively. Never in all his life he'd been so thoroughly treated. Never in all his life he'd been so angry. His strength ebbed, his eyes glazed. You nothing. When the train was flagged, the two men drew through him into the luggage baggage car. The man next he knew, he was dimly aware that his tongue was hurting, and being jolted along in some kind of convenience. The whole shriek of a locomotive whistling a crossing told him where he was. He had travelled too often, the judge not to know the sensation of riding a baggage car. He opened his car eyes, and in, into them came the unbridled anger of a kidnapped king. A man sprang for his throat, but, but was but was too quick for him. His jaws closed on his hand, nor did he relax till his, all his senses were choked out of him. Once more, yip! Has fits, a man said, hiding his mangled hand from the main bankage man, had been attached by the sa- attracted by the sounds of the circle. I'm taking up for the boss in Frisco, a crack dog, dog doctor. He thinks that he can cure him. Concerning that night's ride, the man spoke more equitably for himself in a little shed back of a saloon and on the San Francisco waterfront. Oh, I get his fifty for it, he grumbled. No, I wouldn't do it. For over a thousand cold cash. His hand was wrapped in a bloody handkerchief and the right trouser leg was ripped from knee to ankle. How much did you the other mug get? The saloon keeper demanded. A hundred was the reply. Wouldn't take them as solace to, to, so help me. It makes a hundred and fifty, the saloon keeper calculated. He's worth it. Oh, I'll be, I'm a squarehead. Can up and undid the bloody wrappings and looked at his lacerated hand. If I don't get any of that high pro- pro- properly, it w- it'll be because you've been born to hang, laughed the saloon keeper. Here, lend me your hand before you pull your freight, he added, 
days suffering intolerable pain from throat and tongue, with life half throttled out of him. Buck attempted to face his tormentors, but he was thrown down and choked brutally till they succeeded in filling the bra- huge brass collar. Finally, the huge brass collar from his, off his neck, then the rope was removed and he was flung into a cage like crate. He lay for the remainder of the weary night, nursing his wife and wounded pride. He could not understand what it, what it all meant. What did they want with him, these strange men? Why were they keeping him pent up in this narrow crate? He did not know why he felt oppressed by this vague sense of impending calamity. Several times during the night he sprang to his feet when the shed door rattled open, expecting to see the judge or the boys, at least. But every time it was a bulging face, a saloonkeeper appeared at him by the slight, quickly light of a tallowed candle. Every time the joyful bark that trembled in Buck's face throat was twisted into a savage gnarl growl. But the soon keeper kept him alone in the morning. Four men entered, picked up the crate. More tormentors, Buck decided, for they were evil-looking creatures, ragged and unkept. He stormed and raged at them through the bars, and he laughed and poked sticks at him, which he promptly sailed from his teeth until he realised that this is what they wanted. Upon he lay down sulkily, and were allowed to crate to be lifted into a wagon. Then he, in the crate in which he was imprisoned, went passing through many hands, clerks in the express office took charge of him. He was carted about in another wagon. A truck carried him with an assortment of boxes and parcels under a ferry steamer. He was tucked off the sp- the stream steamer to a great railway depot and finally he was deposited in an express car for two days and nights this express car was dragged along the tail was shrieking locomotives two days and nights Buck neither ate nor drank his anger he met the first advances of express eight immersed messages with growls they were retaliated by teasing him when he flung himself against the bars, quivering and frothing, they laughed at him and taunted him. They growled and barked like dissensible dogs, mewed and flapped their arms and crowed. It's all very silly. He knew that, therefore, the most more outrageous dignity, his anger waxed and waxed. He didn't mind the hunger so much, but the lack of water caused him to swear a severe suffering and found his wolf to receive a pitch. For that writer, I... Strung and highly, very sensitive, the ill treatment had flung him into a fever, which led by inflammation of his parched and swollen tongue, throat and tongue. He was so glad for one thing: a rope was off his neck, it had given them an unfair advantage. But now that it was off, he could show them they would not, never get another rope around his neck. Upon that, he was resolved. For two days and nights, he neither ate nor drank. And during those two days and nights of torment, he accommodated a fund of wrath that body did ill within if ever first fell fell of him. His eyes turned bloodshot. He was manifolsified into a raging fiend. So changed was that he to that judge himself the judge himself would not recognise him. The press messengers breathed relief when they bundled off the train at Seattle. The whole men gingerly carried the crate, the wagon, to a small, high-walled back yard. A stout man with a red sweater sagged with generosity at the neck came out and signed a book of the dri- for the driver. That was a man but divided. divided. The next time we enter, he hurried himself savagely against the bars. The man smiled grimly, brought a, ha- a hatchet in the club. You ain't going to take him out now, the driver asked. Sure, the man replied, driving the hatchet into the crate for pry. 
There was an incident scattering the four men who carried it in and for, for smellish perches on the top of the wall he appeared to watch the performance. Buck rushed at the splintering wood, sinking his teeth into it, surging and wrestling with it. However the hatchet fell on the outside, he was there on the inside, snarling, growling, anxiously, furiously anxious to get out out the man the red swepper was calmly intent on getting him out now you red-eyed devil he said when he made he had made an opening significant for the passage of buck's body at any time he dropped the hatchet and shift shifted the club to his right hand buck was truly a red-eyed devil as he drew himself together for the, for the spring hair bristling mouth foaming a mired glitter in his bloodshot eyes straight in the man he launched his 140 pounds furries of charge the pent passion of two days and nights mid-air just as his jaws were about to close in on the man received a shot that checked his body and brought his teeth to give him an astonishing grip clip he whirled over fetching the ground on his back and side, he'd never been struck by a club in his life. He did not understand the snarl that was part bark and more scream. He was again on his feet and launched in the air, and again the shot came and he brought cursingly to the ground. This time he was aware that it was the club, but his madness knew no caution. A dozen times he charged, and often the club broke the ch- charge and smashed him down. After a particularly fierce blow, he crawled to his feet. Two days to rush, he staggered limply about, the blood flowing from his nose and mouth and ears. His beautiful coat sprayed and freckled with bloody saliva. Then the man advanced and deliberately dealt him a painful, frightful blow on the nose. All the pain he endured was nothing compared to the exquisite agony of this. A roar that was almost lion-like ferocity again hurled himself at the man, but the man, shifting the club from right to left, coolly caught him, caught him by the under by the under jaw, same time wrecking downward and backward. Buck described a cu- a couple of circle, great circle in the air, and half another, then crashed to the ground with his head and chest. For the last time he rushed. The man struck the shrewd blow he had purposely held for so long. A black crumbled up and went down, not us, not utterly senseless. He no slouch of dog breaking, that's what I say. Man of the world cried enthusiastically. Don't fur uh, break coyotes any day, and twice on Sundays replied the waiver. Driver, as he climbed on the wagon, and started the horses. But senses came back to him, but not his strength. He lay there. He had fallen and from where he had watched the man in the red shell sweater. Answers to the name Buck, the man sodotized, quoting from the saloon keeper's letter, which had announced the consignment of the crate and contents. Well, Buck, my boy, he went on in a growing old voice, we're on our little runcheon. The best thing to do, we can do, is to let it go at that. You've learned your place, and I've got no mind. Be a good dog, and you'll be all well, go well. A goose, and a goose hang high. Be a bad dog, and I'll well in the stuffing out of you. I stand as he spoke. He fiercely, fiercely patted the head. So mercy pounded, and for though Burke's hair involuntarily bristled at the point touch, hand he endured it without protest. The man brought him water, he drank eagerly, and Leonita bolted a generous meal of raw meat, chunk by chunk, for the man's hand. He broke, beaten. He knew that, but he was not broken. He saw once for all, he stood no chance against a man with a club. He had learned the lesson, and all of his, and all his, in all his after life, he never forget it. The club was a revelation. It was an introduction to the reign of primitive law. It meant you met the introduction halfway. The facts of life drew for his uh, aspect, and while he faced in that aspect and crowd, he faced it with all the lament cunning of his natural ra- nature aroused. 
and the days went by other horses dogs came in crates and the end of ropes some doisy some raging and roaring as had he come and one and all he watched them pass on the denomination the man in a red sweater again again he looked at each, each brutal performance of the image with broken home to brick a man with a club was a lawgiver, a master to be paid, though not necessarily considered. Of the, that, this last buck was not had never been guilty, though he hadn't seen dog, big dogs and fawned upon the man. Men wagged their tails and licked his hand. Also, he saw one dog, and would neither considerate or nor bay never killed in the struggle for ministry now and again men came strangers now and again men came strangers who talked excitedly weirdly and all kinds of fashions to the man in the red sweater at such times the money passed between them stranger took one or t- more of the dogs away with them but wondered where they went but they never came back but the fear of the future was strong upon him he glared every time when he was not selected yet this time came in the end the reform of we the reason man who spoke British spoke Broton English and many strange and uncouth explanations which Buck could not understand Secordum he cried with his eyes Scattered him, he cried when he when his eyes lit lit on Buck. Dan one bulldog. Uh, how much? Three hundred at present that with a promptly prompt ready of the man in red sweater. And see him it's government money, you ain't got no kick coming, uh Pressure Pressure grinned. Certainly that Considering that the price of dogs had been boomed skyward, the unwanted demand is not an unfair sum for so fine an animal. The Canadian government would not be, be no loser, nor would its patches travel the, the slower. Pendurant knew dogs, and when he looked at the buck, he knew he won in a thousand, one in ten thousand, he commented it mentally. Buck saw money pass between them, and not surprised McCurley and the good natured Northumberman, and he was led away by the little wizard, wizard man. At last he saw the man in the red sweater, the curly, he looked at the red exceeding Seattle, with a beck of the world. It at last he saw the warm sunland curly, and he had take, been, were taken below by Perrot, and taken over to black-faced giant called Francis Pegrelot was a French-Canadian a smarmy but Francis was a french Canadian half-breed and twice a smarmy they were kind of men very kind of men, men to the men to Buick of which he was destined to see many more and while he developed affection for them he nonetheless grown honestly to respect them he speedily learned that Pelcote what Francis were fair men just and impartial in the ministry and justice and too wise in the way of the dogs to be fooled by dogs in doing decks of never well Buck and Curly joined by two other dogs one of them was a big snow white fellow from Spixerberg, who had been brought away by the whaling captain, and who had later occupied dreadful sight into barons. If friendly in a tetris sort of way, smiling into one's face the while he meditated some animist hand trick, as he, for instance, when he stole from Buck's food for his meal, and Buck sprang to finish him, punish him, a lash of the princess's whip ran through the air, reaching the cub halt first, and nothing remained to, to Buck but to discover the bone that fair Francis Francis he decided half breed between his rise Buck's explanation. The other dog came made no advances nor arrived seed any. Also, he did not attempt to steal them from the go comers. He is a gloomy and morose fellow. He showed Curly plainly his desire was to be left alone of fervor. There must be trouble if he could let only 
if he were not let left alone, Dave, he, he was called. He gripped and slept and yawned between the times and took interest in nothing like even when the Darwell crossed. Ocean cocoa Charlotte sound rolled in the pitch and butt like a thing possessed with buck and curly grew sighted half wild with fear he raised his head so annoyed favoured them with an incredulous glance yawned and went to sleep again day and night the ship throbbed to the tallest pulse of the propeller pro- 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 and no through one day was very like another no one day was like any other it was apparent to Buck that the weather was steadily growing colder. At last, one morning the propeller was white, quite now well was prevented, prevailed, pervaded with the atmosphere of excitement. He felt it as did the other dogs and knew what a change was in that the change the hand. Francis leached them. I brought them back on deck. A first step upon the cold surface, Buck's feet sank in the white, mushy, something very like mud. His bare back was snort. More of his white stuff was falling through the air. He took himself shook himself, and more he fell down upon him. He sniffed it curiously, then licked some of his uh, on his tongue. It felt like fire, and the next instant was gone. This puzzled him. He tried it again with the same result. The onlookers laughed uproariously. He felt ashamed. He knew not why, but it was his first snow.